Now here is the reading of God's word for the sermon. Revelation chapter 21. Let us hear what God has to say to us this morning. This is his holy word. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there will no longer be any death, nor will there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of, from the, the, spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the, the sorcerers and idolaters are all, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the, one of the, the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of... Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, Come. Here I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and, 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 and at, at the gates twelve angels, and the names were written on them, which, were the, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. And there, were, and there were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12, foundations, 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke to me had a, great, had a gold measuring rod uh, to measure the city uh, and its gates and its wall. And the city was laid out as a square and its length is as great as, as, it, as the width. And he measured the city with a rod. 1,500 miles its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which is also the angelic measurement. The material on the wall was like jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx. The sixth, Sardius, the seventh, Chrysolite, the eighth, Beryl, the ninth, Topaz, the tenth, Chrysophrase, the eleventh, Jacinth, the the twelfth, Amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord... God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the lamb is the Lamb. The nations will ask the, sorry, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring glory and honor to the nation glory and honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is the completion of the reading of God's word for the sermon. And the church said, Amen. Thank you. We'll dive, we will dive straight in this morning. And uh, the title of my sermon on this Lord's Day morning, as we come to the almost conclusion of our sermon series here on the end times, the title of my sermon is, which city do you belong to? Which city do you belong to? 
We have quickly reached the end of the book of Revelation and um, we consider uh, chapter 21 and 22 the end of the book, the end of the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, uh, the completed canon of scripture. As we speak about the end, because there is an end, there must be a beginning, right? There is a beginning and an end. In the beginning, there is Genesis. In the beginning, we find creation. And in the end, we have the culmination. So in the beginning, there's the creation. And the end is the culmination. And I take you back to recall the first sermon on this sermon series where I made clear to you that all through redemptive history, there are these seas. What are the seas? There's creation. There's corruption. Then there's a catastrophe. Then there's a confusion. And then we find Christ, then we find the cross, and then we find the consummation or the culmination, which is the end. So the culmination or uh, the consummation of all things is what we call in theological terms, eschatology. I remind you this morning, one more time, eschatology uh, is another close word that we came across is soteriology and uh, Christology. So Christology or Christology is the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Soteriology is our study and understanding of salvation, which we will be, again I'm announcing to you, be looking at in October. Here we have eschatology, which is the study of the end times, an understanding of the end times, an understanding of the culmination of things, the end of things. So Christian eschatology looks to study and discuss matters such as death and afterlife, heaven and hell, the second coming of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ, the last judgment, and then the new heaven and the new earth. Beloved, as we look at these, as we consider these, we must understand that as we look at the many spectacular visual Uh, uh, manifestations of God in the Bible, I think that nothing, nothing, uh, you may disagree, but uh, this is my understanding, nothing compares uh, with the second coming of Jesus. The parting of the Red Sea is a mighty act of God with splendor and wonder, and I'm sure it was a spectacular sight, but I think it will not compare to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The first coming was in many ways veiled and cloaked and covered by God. He allowed only a few people to to, to know and to see the second coming, sorry, the first coming of Jesus. For example, the Magi, the, the, the shepherds, Mary's cousin Elizabeth. These were people who knew God allowed them to know of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Not everybody knew of it. They were privy, they were, God showed them about the birth and the coming of Jesus in the first coming. Jesus in the first coming came to be a servant. In the first Coming, he he, he came as a man acquainted with sorrows and grief. In the first coming, he was born in the manger in Bethlehem. And he came in the first coming in lowliness and humiliation. He took on the form of a servant in the first coming. And he was despised and rejected of men in the first coming. In the first coming, he was betrayed into the hands of wicked men, condemned by an unjust judgment. In the first coming, he was mocked and, and scourged and crowned with thorns. In the first coming, he was crucified between two thieves. But oh, beloved in Christ, what a glorious thing this is to know and understand and recognize the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, in the second coming, he will come not now as a lowly servant, but he will come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will come as King of all the earth with royal majesty and splendor. Amen. The princes and great men of this world shall themselves stand before his throne to receive their eternal sentence. Before this great king of king and lord of lords, every mouth shall be stopped, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I say that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does it mean? There will be not only you believers who are confessing, that Jesus Christ is Lord, but there will also be unbelievers confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because in that eternal sentence, they will come to terms with the fact that there is the true and living God. They will be, they will be believers on that day. Not believers like you who have been saved, but believers who are now saying, I now believe. 
And that is why even when we were preaching in Chepstow yesterday, we made it very clear that there is, your atheism will come to an end one day. That you who profess to be atheist today and you say there is no God, on that day you will say there is a God. Because you will stand before him in judgment. And then you will say there is a God. And so we find when Jesus came the first time, there was no room for him in the inn. When he comes a second time, he will take ownership of the earth. When he came the first time, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. When he comes a second time, he'll come riding on a mighty white horse. And he'll come at full speed and full splendor. In the first coming, he wore a crown of thorns. But in his second coming, he will have many diadems, many jewel crowns upon his head. When he came the first time, he came as a lowly servant. When he comes the second time, he comes as a bold sovereign to rule and to reign the King of kings and the Lord of lords. At his first coming, he was executed. But at his second coming, he will be exalted. At his first coming, men condemned and judged him. But at his second coming, he will be the righteous judge of all men. At his first coming, he stood before Pilate. And we say to you, my friends, beloved in Christ, at his second coming, Pilate will stand before him to receive his eternal sentence. At his second coming, everything will be visibly reversed. God will reign on the earth. Satan will be bound and thrown into the lake of fire. Wrong will be made right and sin will be punished. This is the glorious visible reality That awaits this world. All will know of Christ's return. This is a great and glorious truth for us, isn't it? In Revelation 21, we come to the end now and we see the recorded history of man is at its end. All of the ages have come and gone. This is what we see in the book of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. All of the ages have come and gone. Now we've reached the end. And before we expound that end, let's just take two seconds, three seconds, a minute to just take us through a quick glimpse, a tour very quickly of what we've learned so far and what is is going to happen uh, at the end. Christ has gathered his church in the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. He comes and he gathers his believing ones. That immediately triggers the seven-year tribulation in Revelation chapter 6 to uh, 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 chapter 18. The, the, the seven-year tribulation, the most awful time to live on planet earth. And the seven-year tribulation and the awful time is not by chance, nor by coincidence. And it's not something that Satan has done, but God sovereignly, sovereignly punishing, judging the earth. The battle of Armageddon has been fought and won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 19, verse 17 to 21. Satan has been bound in the abyss and the Antichrist and the false prophet have been thrown into the lake of fire. We see a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 3. Then after a 1,000 years, Satan is released for a short time. The final rebellion of God uh, is underway, but it's quashed. It is, it, is, it, is, it is defeated and Satan has received his just judgment and eternity in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 to 10. Then we find the great white throne judgment has taken place and And unbelieving mankind is judged. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 to 15. We also see the judgment seat of Christ. The beamer seat of Christ. Where believers will be judged and rewarded. Not for salvation but for post salvation works. That's a quick tour. Of what we've studied over the last month. We've covered all of this up until the end of July. And now, and now we come to Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. And in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, we see the beginning in the end. We see the beginning in the end. What do I mean by that? There is a beginning in the end. The end has the beginning. And God culminates that. He puts that together wonderfully for us in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. What do I mean by that? Well, what God set out to do in the beginning, in in creation, in Genesis, is finally accomplished in the end, in the culmination. What we see in creation is finally finished and fully accomplished in the culmination. For example, in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we see 
Genesis chapter 1 opens with these words, right? It opens with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Genesis chapter 1. And we see that now with, with John in, 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 in verse 1 of Revelation 21. It begins the same way. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Can you see that? The beginning is in the end. Now, as we consider verse 1, as we consider verse 1 of Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, as we consider that, like I said, this is not a revamped or a restored or a redecorated heaven and earth. No, this is a brand new heaven and earth. How do we know that? What also qualifies us to think that? Well, if you remember Revelation chapter 20, the previous chapter, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them, right? So the existing earth is uncreated by God. The existing earth is uncreated by God, making place for the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. Are you with me so far? So the Bible tells us in advance of this, for example. It tells us in advance of what's happening here in Revelation 21. For example, in Isaiah 65 and verse 17, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. So Isaiah speaks of this. Isaiah 66, the following chapter, Isaiah says in Isaiah 66 and verse 22, he says, For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your descendants and your name endure. And so we find, a, once again, a recognition of the new heaven and the new earth. Now, I haven't asked you to go to Isaiah, but I will ask you to go uh, to Second Peter. So if you look at Second Peter, put your bookmark on Revelation 21. And uh, we'll go to Second Peter, and uh, I will look at uh, chapter three. I will begin at verse verse three, and we'll read up until verse thirteen. Second Peter chapter three, beginning at verse three. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Uh, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So if Second Peter, Peter recognizes there's coming a time where the, the earth will go under this judgment and it's going to be fire. But do not let this one fact escape you or escape your, not, your notice beloved that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but it is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the enemy, then the elements will be destroyed with the intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up uh huh. That's what's going to happen, right? This is how the earth is going to be destroyed. Intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening uh, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Aha, uh -huh. interesting, right? And so what you have here, my friends, is uh, the perfect 
uh, defense for all of the global warming uh, Greta Thunberg supporters. So when the BBC and the, the rest of them try to tell you that, uh, uh, that the, the, the earth is going to end in 40 years time or that uh, uh, because of all these things that are happening, uh, the, 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 we have no chance it's going to end. We have no f- future for our children. Uh, ex- extension, extension, extinction rebellion uh, will have these massive, massive protests and block the traffic and do all sorts of things to show the world that, hey, do you not care that the world is going to end in 40 years' time? We have no future for our children. Well, my dear friends, let us preach the gospel to them and say that this is not yours to say when it will end. This is of God's. This is God's earth. And He will say when it will end. And he tells us how it will end. And we see that in Isaiah. We see that in Second Peter. We see how God will bring this to an end. It will end when God says it will end. So there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the immediate context uh, uh, we are not given. In, in this immediate context in Revelation 21. Go back to Revelation 21. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the, for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away. And so we find that there is no other description given to us in the immediate context about the new heaven and the new earth. What we do know is that in the next part of verse 1, we get told, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away. And we see now, and there, are, there is no longer any sea. That's the first description we have. We know it is new and we get told about something that we can understand, the sea. We know the sea, right? We know the sea. And so... We get told by John, the first description here, there is no longer any sea. I imagine that for a moment. A new heaven and a new earth, there is no longer any sea. Well, we must understand this a little further. Let's take a few seconds to, to let that sink in and try to uh, understand this a little further. Well, we must understand then that water occupies, water occupies a very large part of the earth's surface, Right? Over 70% of the earth is occupied by water. In the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more seawater. Our only reference to water in the new heaven and the new earth is in uh, verse 1 of chapter 22. You look at verse 1 of chapter 22, go to the next chapter. It says, and, and he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb of God in the middle of its street. But this here is not physical water. It's not physical water in Revelation 22, verse 1. In the human form, right now, in the human form, on the existing earth, there is so much physical water because water is needed to sustain life. In fact, in this earthly form, our bodies have a very high percentage of water. Now, in the glorified body... In the glorified body, praise the Lord, we will have no need of this physical water. Our life will be sustained by the river of life, the water of life. Our life will be sustained by God himself. Amen. No need for this physical water. And so our first description here in the immediate context about the new heaven and the new earth is that there is no longer any sea. Now, for those people who love fishing and snorkeling and scuba diving and wave boarding and whatever, too bad. <laughs> no sea. Now, this brings up a few questions, right? If there's no sea, this brings up a few questions. What happens to all the sea creatures? Well, we do not know. The Bible doesn't tell us because John has not been shown this. So I'm not going to go into something that John has not been shown. I do not know the answer to that question, except that we know that there is no longer any sea. I look at verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So John is now focusing on the central picture of this vision. This is what he's called to see. The central picture of this vision and the central picture, the central subject here is the new Jerusalem. Now, we must keep in mind that the New Jerusalem is an actual city. It is a literal city. Now, some in theological circles have have said that the New Jerusalem is heaven. 
Uh, I, I, I don't think it is heaven. I think uh, we, we are given a clear description here from verse 10 to verse 21. And as you begin to look at verse 10 to verse 21, you see it as a literal physical building, a, a literal physical uh, uh, a city, um, not a building, a literal physical city. And if you look at it very clearly, uh, and he, it says in verse, verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like very costly stone, uh, as the stone of, of, of crystal clear jasper. And he goes on to, to bring these, these, these descriptions of the city. So I come to understand that it is a, it is a literal city. What else causes me to believe and understand that it's a literal city? Well, we must also note especially that it has a measurement. It has a measurement. Look at, look at, look at verses 16 to 17. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with a rod, uh, 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, its height are equal. Uh, uh, and he measured its wall. And so what we, what we find here, it's an actual measurement. It's an actual measurement. Therefore, this cannot be heaven. The new Jerusalem cannot be heaven because heaven has no physical measurements. Are you with me so far? We find that the new Jerusalem is a literal city coming out of heaven to the earth. Further, the fact that this is a literal city I believe, is in keeping with John chapter 14. If you remember in John chapter 14, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you, because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again, and I will take you to myself, so that, that, that where I am, there, or, there you also will be. So I, I, think this is in, I think this is in keeping with it being a literal city. As one Bible teacher says, he says that uh, if you look at the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven as a city coming out of heaven, he says you have to look at it possibly in this way, that the new Jerusalem is the capital city of heaven. It's the capital city of heaven. Heaven is the wider place without those physical dimensions, but Jerusalem being that, the, sorry, the new Jerusalem being that, that, that literal city in heaven that, that's prepared already beforehand to come to earth. We must also note that this is a new city. A new Jerusalem. The text tells us. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city a new Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is mentioned a number of times in scripture. It was even read this morning in Matthew 23. Jerusalem was soaked in sin. Jerusalem is, is a part of creation. It is soaked in sin. It's rejected its prophets, it's rejected the message, it's rejected the message of God. Where we find the new Jerusalem is an altogether new city, an eternal city, a city created by God. I think also there is a significance to the new eternal city, the new Jerusalem. And I say it's, it's also significant in the sense that it stands in stark contrast to another city. What is the other city? Well, the city, Babylon the Great. The New Jerusalem stands in contrast to Babylon the Great. That is the other city. In the same way God marked his people with a countermark to the mark of the Antichrist. You remember, the Antichrist had their mark. And we find in the following verses, God marked his people to be recognized by a particular mark. And here God created a contrasting eternal city to that great city. Oh, that... that, that uh, evil, sinful place called Babylon the Great. That city called Babylon the Great. Further, we find that the new Jerusalem is a holy city. It is holy because of the one who made it is holy. It's also holy because of the ones who dwell in it. It is occupied by the redeemed, the saints of God occupy that city. The ones who occupy it are blessed and holy. They are the saved ones. And Revelation 20 verse 6 tells us, blessed, are the, uh, 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 blessed and holy are those who belong to the first resurrection. That's you and I. Blessed and holy are those who belong to the first resurrection. So those who would occupy the new Jerusalem, uh, 
regarded in Revelation 20 as blessed and holy. And therefore John refers to this as the holy city, the new Jerusalem. So this is not the Jerusalem that is in creation. This is not the Jerusalem that's upon the earth. This is a new Jerusalem. The the Jerusalem upon the earth is a sin-soaked city. It's rejected its prophets. It's rejected the message of God. It's rejected the Messiah. It is in contrast, the new Jerusalem is in contrast to also another city that will come in the future, uh, Babylon the Great. These are the two cities, the new Jerusalem and Babylon the Great. And so even right now, almost in the middle of my sermon, I ask you the question, which city are you a resident of? Which city do you belong to? Are you a resident of the new Jerusalem or are you a resident of Babylon the Great? If you're listening to this by way of the video broadcast on YouTube, we ask you the question also today, are you a resident of the New Jerusalem or are you a resident of Babylon the Great? It is the believers in Christ who are the residents of the holy city, the New Jerusalem, and those who are not of God, who are part of that evil city, Babylon the Great. We find also in our text that this city comes down from heaven, already prepared by God. Already prepared, already prepared. How do we know that? Verse 2 tells us that. Look at verse 2 again. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's already prepared. It's already prepared, beloved in Christ. God is not gonna, God is not gonna hurriedly run around in the end and say, Oh, I didn't forget to put this together and put that together. No, it's already prepared as a, a bride adorned for her husband. Here once again we have the beginning in the end. Remember what I said at the the beginning of my sermon. In Revelation 21 and 22, the beginning is in the end. I gave you the example of what I mean. It begins in verse 1. The new heaven and the new earth. Here also in verse 2 we find the beginning in the end. What do I mean? Well in the beginning in Genesis we we see the marriage of Adam and Eve. Right? The marriage of Adam and Eve. If you go back and remember the Biblical Wisdom for the Family series, you'll remember that God created Adam. God created Adam and said uh, to, uh, uh, to have a, a dominion and to rule and to reign. As, as Adam looked across the, the plains, as Adam looked across the earth, uh, he found that Mr. Giraffe had a Mrs. Giraffe, Mr. Lion had a Mrs. Lion, and Mr. Elephant had a Mrs. Elephant, but there was no Mrs. Adam for Mr. Adam. So what did God do? God put Adam to sleep, and out of Adam's side, God took a woman, a wombed man, another man, a wombed man, and her name was Eve. God created a, a woman from man for man. And that is not a statement that the feminists want to hear today. Women exist today. The purpose of women, women exist today. If you're, a, if you're a Christian woman today, not if you're a Christian woman today, you as a Christian woman today know, must know and understand this. As Christian men understand the reason why they're here, and their primary purpose, we understand that women was made from man for man. You can't argue with the text. Your argument is not with the preacher. Your argument is with the sovereign God. So feminists do not want to hear this today. What, I'm created for man? Yes, that's what the Bible says. God made you from man for man. And if you want to know more about that, you can... Um, Look at the sermon online for that. I think it's called exactly that. A woman created from him and for him. And so we find then that that, that in Revelation 21, in the end, the beginning is in the end. In the beginning, in Genesis, uh, uh, we find that the marriage of Adam and Eve, God creates Eve out of Adam. Then God walks Eve down the aisle and God gives Eve to Adam. And God is the minister at their wedding. He officiates their wedding. He joins them. And out of that we have the text, for this reason a man shall leave his mother and father and the two shall become one flesh. We have that, we have that most crucial text that binds and holds marriages together. Then in Revelation 21, we see marriage again. We see marriage again. 
The beginning is in the end, this marriage again. In the, in the new Jerusalem, we see the culmination of the marriage now between Christ and his church. Between Christ and you. Between the bridegroom and the church. Between the bridegroom and the bride. The marriage event here in Revelation 21 is the final stage. It is the stage of consummation where the bride and groom will live together forever. Oh, let me remind you one more time, my dear friends, of that three-part process of marriage, that Jewish marriage process that we see all through the Bible. Do you remember that process? If you can, great. But let me remind you if you forgot. The first stage of that process would be uh, the bridal parties would meet and uh, they would decide to marry. Their parents would come together and they would sign a document, a marital contract. Uh, but they, hus- the husband and wife would not go be together. The, the husband would, that's, that's the first part. The second part is the, the, the husband, the, the bridegroom would leave the bride and he would go. So the signing would be the seal that we are married, we are betrothed. But we no longer sleep together. We don't consummate the marriage. We don't live together. Why? Because I need to go and prepare a place for you. And that's what he does. He goes to prepare a place for his bride. Whether it is to, whether it is to build a house or whether it is to uh, get a job, whatever it is. He goes to another place to secure a, 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 a blessing for his new wife. And then the third process, he comes back again You remember, we spoke about the virgins uh, with their lamps. They would all go out and light the way and say, hey, the bridegroom is coming to take his bride. If you remember that sermon. And so that's the third part, that he would come to take his bride and then to take his bride to where he is so that they can consummate the marriage. Now, how does it apply to us? Well, very simply, number one, the bride is chosen and the marriage certificate is made. That is our salvation. You are the bride. Christ came for you and he secured you. He he came to secure you. And what did he do? He signed the document. What is the document? This is the document, the ring that he puts upon the finger and says, you are mine. But you see, it's not this physical ring. You sang it in the song that we said today. He has sealed you by the power of his spirit until that great and glorious day. That is the signing. That is the seal that you have. You've been sealed by God for that great and glorious day. And by that sealing, he's saying, I'm coming back again. I've gone to prepare a place for you. You are mine. I have sealed you. You're on the earth. I've sealed you. But don't worry, I'm coming back for you, he says. And when he says he sealed you, you remember what we sang, what we sing in that song, In Christ Alone, the last stanza. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck pluck me from your hand. In other words, even as you traverse this human world, as you are a pilgrim through this land, heading to the new Jerusalem, nothing and nobody can snatch you from the bridegroom. You are his, sealed by the Spirit. Amen. The second process is the bridegroom goes away to prepare a place for the new bride. And then we find... The third process, he's coming back again for his bride. And this is Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This is the final step. This is the the consummation part. The bride is ready here, my dear friends. The bride is ready. But know here that the bride is not only the church from the church age, But the bride is all those who have been redeemed by the Lord, including the Old Testament believers. Look at verse 22 to 27 of Revelation 21. Look at verse 22 to 27. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. 
but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we have a further description here of what's happening in this new Jerusalem. We find that John tells us there is no need for a temple because God is ever present with his people and his blazing glory, amen. His blazing glory fills everything. As one Bible teacher says, and I quote this, he says, life will be worship and worship will be life, end quote. Life will be worship and worship will be life. At that very moment, dear friends, at that very moment that we see in Revelation 21 with the, with the new Jerusalem coming and the bride and the groom coming together, believers will be in perfect union and communion with the Lord God Almighty. The bride and the bridegroom will be, will be together in that most special way. This is the believer in perfect union with the Lord God Almighty. The believer will never again know what it feels like For example, when David cries out to God, Lord, you are far away from me. You've forgotten me. I feel so distant from you. We will never again cry out to God, for we will be with God and the Lamb in the most closest and intimate way. Verse 3, look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, I heard a loud voice from heaven, Sorry, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Wow. Wow. John hears a loud voice, maybe an angel speaking with him. And, and, and he says, Behold. What does, it mean? what does it mean? Behold. Behold means look. Look. Uh, 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 be attentive to what you're watching. Look. Take notice. And what do we have to take notice of? We have to take notice of the tabernacle of God is among the people. God will tabernacle. God will pitch a tent amongst his people. God will pitch a tent amongst his people. This truth is so profound. It is so, it is so profound and so real that John hears it a second time. He hears it a second time. He says, he, God, will dwell among his people. God will dwell among his people. Brethren, beloved in Christ, what a glorious picture this is. In times past, the believing ones like you and I had just a taste or a a small glimpse of the presence of God. Here in the eternal state, here in the new Jerusalem, the believing ones will dwell in the constant presence of God. This is the culmination of all things, to be in the eternal, constant presence of God. God is glorified in this. He has planned to tabernacle with man. He's planned to, da- to tabernacle with you and I, to, for the bridegroom to be with the bride. And here in the culmination, the sinful man who is saved is ever in the glorious presence of God. Oh, what a wonderful picture that is. What a glorious thing this is, my dear friends. And that is why we pray, come Lord Jesus, come. That we may be ever in your glorious presence. That we may be in your blazing glory eternally. And when we are in the presence of God, verse 4 follows then. Verse 4 says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. And uh, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Oh my dear friends. Why do we pray? Why do we long to be with with, with our God? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Fulfill those things, Lord, that you said you would fulfill in the new heaven and the new earth. Why? Because verse 4, look at verse 4, just wonderfully slams us dead in the face. He says, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The new eternal state, I tell you, my friends, is so different from what we are in now. Oh, yes, indeed, it's so different from what we are in now that John is actually shown a few ways for to make us understand. Actually, these words are only to make us understand. To make us understand in our way of thinking, in our way of understanding what that is going to be like. I'm so looking forward to that day. Amen. And John here is making it clear. He puts out these words. He's been told these things to make us understand what it's going to be like. 
What does he say? Listen to what he says. Firstly, number one, John hears the voice saying to its saints, uh, sorry, John hears this voice saying, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye. This is, listen, listen. This is not the saints. This is not you and I. This is not the believers in God wiping away our tears. It doesn't say that the angel is wiping away the tears of the believing ones. It says he. Oh, hallelujah. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God himself wipe away every tear from their eyes. Whatever your tears, my friends, whatever you've mourned over in this present life, whatever you've cried over, whatever you've wet your carpet in prayer over, whatever you've knelt at the altar of prayer in your home and interceded over and cried over and mourned over, God says on that day, there will be no more tears. I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. The picture that we're coming across here is a picture of the absence of sorrow in the eternal state. That's what it's telling us. It's the absence of sorrow. Wrapped up in this part of the verse when he says, I will wipe away every tear from your eye. He's putting across to us that there will be no more sorrow in the eternal state. There'll be, no, there'll be nothing to cry about in the ever presence of God. There'll be no sorrow, no disappointment, no depression, no despondency. There will be no tears over any of these. Oh, how we long for those days, friends. How we long for those days, my friends. And then he says, secondly, secondly, John hears that there will be no longer any death. And that's clear, right? It's clear. I'm not going to expound on that any further. that That great curse, that great sting, death will no longer be there. We will live eternally with our God, in the presence of our God. And then thirdly, he says, there will no longer be any mourning or crying, our text tells us. No longer be any mourning or crying. And this is still connected, this is still connected. He says, you see, because death, death produces in those uh, left behind a sorrow and a mourning which leads to crying. Here in the eternal state, there is no death. And therefore, no longer any mourning or crying. Oh, praise the Lord. Huh? Amen. Praise the Lord indeed. Consider this for a moment. Sin, since sin is a great cause of sorrow, since sin is a great cause of sorrow, and sin we know has been fully dealt with in Jesus Christ, now in the culmination of all things, there is no sorrow for the believing ones. Number four on that text of verse four, number four, he says this, there is no pain. I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying. And number four, there is no pain. In the absence of sin, in the absence of death, there will be no crying and there will be no pain. Believers in their glorified bodies will not be in pain. Pain will not exist in the eternal state. Oh, how we lovingly reached out to a man yesterday. A man hobbles over on his, on his walking stick. And you can clearly see from his physical state that he's not well in body. He walks up and he says to me, Oh, I have come to tell you today that your God has killed my family. Your God has given me cancer. Your God has given all my family cancer. They've all died. I'm the only one left. And I have cancer and I am going to die. Your God has given me this cancer. And so firstly, we began to speak with him and I said, sir, firstly, the premise of your argument is incorrect. I said, who told you God gave you this cancer? And nobody had asked him the question before. See, he's made up in his mind that God has given him this disease. And he's 
hurting and he's mourning and he's crying over those that he has lost. His parents have died of cancer. His brothers and sisters have died of cancer. He's the last one left. You can see in his eyes he's filled with sorrow and pain. And then I began to speak with him and speak to him of that great and glorious day. And you come to Jesus Christ and you plead with him to forgive you of your sins. And that you be born again. You become a child of God. A son of God. A believing one. The bride of Christ. And there is a place reserved for you. In that new Jerusalem. Where you will be in the ever presence of God. And you will cry no longer. You will mourn no longer. And there will be pain no longer. This is our destination. My dear friends. In the ever presence of God. We were read this morning from Psalm 27. Put your bookmark on Revelation 21. Um, We were read this morning in our prayer from from, from Psalm 27. And David says in verse 4 of Psalm 27. Listen to what he says. The one thing I have asked from the Lord. I'll wait for you to get there. Psalm 27. Verse 4. The one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Do you not cry when you read that? Do you not see David's heart the way he longs to be? He doesn't long to be the king. He doesn't long to be the ruler. He doesn't long to be over men. There's one place that he longs to be. It is in the presence of God. He longs to be in the presence. The one thing I have asked in the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. And in the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy and I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. This, my dear friends, this prayer of David, this confession of David is fully realized in the consummation of all things. It's fully realized in Revelation 21. David will be in that eternal state. In the new Jerusalem. He will one one day. He will be in that place where he is dwelling permanently. In that everlasting state. In the glory of God. In the presence of God. Oh what a great joy that is my friends. For us even today. That we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. That is where we will be my friends. In the presence of God. In the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 5 to verse 6 of Revelation 21. And he sits on the throne. And he who sits on the throne said. Behold I am making all things new. And he said right for these things are faithful and true. Then he said to me it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Now John is spoken to by God himself. The one who sits on the throne is speaking with him. And the one who sits on the throne is the Alpha and the Omega. The glorious truth is again told to John. He says, all things are new. A new heaven and a new earth. God himself saying there will be no longer any death, no decay, no sorrow, no pain, no mourning. How we have longed for this, my friends. How we long for this even now. Come Lord Jesus come. Quicken, hasten. That we may be in that eternal state with you. That we may be in that glorious state with you. John is directed to write and he said. Look look at what the verse says. He says write these for these words are faithful and true. Well what is he to write? What is he to write? Well John tells us. It is done. It is done. That's what he's to write. It is done. That's what he's to understand. It is done. Well, what is done? What is done is the question. 
Well, the answer is very simple. All that Jesus said he would do, all that God purposed for man in salvation has been done. The last time we heard, the last time we heard similar words to this, it is done. The last time we heard similar words to this, do you remember that where was the last time you heard these words? Where? On the cross of Calvary. Father, it is finished. It is done. What was done? The work of salvation, the paying the price, atoning for the sacrifice of sin is done. No other lamb was needed. Jesus fulfilled what he came to do. The work of salvation is finished by the Lord on that old rugged cross. The work of salvation being finished, but the work of the church is not finished, right? Why? Because God gives us that great commission, go into all of the world and preach the gospel. Go and teach about him, go and preach about him, baptize in his name. So salvation is finished in that Jesus accomplished it. But the preaching of that salvation, the preaching of the gospel, the good news is to go on. That work is not finished. But now we hear Revelation 21. It is done. It is finished. What does it mean? It means there's no longer any need for the Great Commission. No longer any need to stand in Bristol and preach. No longer any need for anyone to go out and do anything. Why? Because it is done. It's finished. This is the culmination of all things. Oh, my dear friends, when you think about it, when you think about it, this is the, the, number, the number of the elect before the foundation of the world. The ones whom God has chosen before the foundation of the world to be saved from every tribe and tongue and nation. That number of people is the exact number in the eternal state. It is finished. It's done. It's over. The believer lives in the eternal state of God's glory. And their life is worship and worship is their life. The unbeliever is also facing a blaze. The, the, the believer is facing the blazing glory of God. And the unbeliever is also facing something that is blazing. Except it is the blazing heat and torment of the lake of fire. For them, life is eternal torment. And eternal torment is life. For the believer, for the believer, their life is worship and worship is life. For the unbeliever... Life is eternal torment, and eternal torment is their life. I'm glad we got the introduction out of the way. Let's get into the sermon now. <laughs> verse 6 to verse 7. Verse 6 to verse 7. I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. The one who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Quickly, very, just give you three things here, very quickly. And when I say quickly, I don't mean to undermine in any way God's word or to give it less attention. Verse 6 to verse 7, Revelation 21, I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And the one who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Let's look at three things here. Number one, from verse 6 to verse 7, thirsts. Underline the word, highlight it, put an asterisk next to it, whatever you want to do. The word thirsts. On that great day, on that great feast in the book of John, where literal water was poured uh, uh, to mark the blessing of God on the, on the children of Israel as they, as, they, as they were journeying towards their promised land in, in, in need of water, God provided water for them. Uh, God is the God of, of, of providence. He provided water for them. And so here now in, in, in Jerusalem at this great feast, literal water was poured uh, 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 at, at this sacrifice, at this feast uh, to celebrate and give thanks for God who gave them water in the wilderness. Jesus seeing that water being poured stands up and he says, I am the living water. He says, you pour this all you want every year, it's not going to do you any good. Come to me, I am the living water. Drink of me, take of me, he says. I am the living water. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, Jesus says. And then he says, listen in, in verse 6 to verse 7 of Revelation 21, they will drink without cost. 
Why? Why? It will cost the one who drinks nothing, but it will cost the Lord everything. Jesus paid the price that we may have this living water. He paid the price. Jesus paid the price with his precious blood on Calvary's cross. The next word we look at is that he who overcomes. Well, the one who thirsts, we've briefly spoken about that. Well, how about the one who overcomes? In the book of 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse 4 to verse 5, he says, Whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we see from this text in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 5, that, that, the, that the overcomer is the one who exercises faith in God. He's the one who has drunk of the living water. In the description of the seven churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation, the true Christian there is recognized as an overcomer. Regularly we find that word there, the true Christian is recognized as an overcomer. So the overcomer then, the true Christian, he will receive an inheritance. And that inheritance will be in full. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 4, we hear, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Amen. So these are the great promises of God in its complete fulfillment. But the greatest of these, we spoke about thirst, we spoke about overcoming, we spoke about inheritance, but the greatest of these will be the last part of that verse, verse 6 to verse 7. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Oh, what a great joy this is. This is the fulfillment. This, I will be his God and he will be my son. In this earthly life, we are called and uh, we are called the adopted of God. In the end, in the culmination, in the fulfillment of all things, this adoption is fully realized, finally realized. We are his sons and he is our God. We'll end with verse 8. Verse 8 says this, But the cowardly and the unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I will next week pick up from verse 8 as we continue. But understand here, there is the part that is for you, the believer in Christ, and then the part in verse 8 for the unbeliever. But for the cowardly, who is the cowardly? Well, the cowardly are those who make some sort of profession of Christ and fall along the wayside. Uh, we can make reference to the parable about the soils and the ground in this context. So these are those who make some sort of profession and uh, through their difficulties, which they think they can't follow God, will reject God or walk away. Uh, uh, here, John refers to them as the cowardly. Well, the cowardly will have their place. Where will that be? Well, in, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then John says, the unbelieving. Who are the unbelieving? Well, by definition, an unbeliever is a non-believer. He doesn't believe in Christ. The unbelieving ones here are the ones without Christ. Where is their part? Well, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then it's the abominable and the murderers and the sexually immoral and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. Their part will be in the lake of fire. Now, there are some who will say, well, uh, my, uh, my certain sin is not in here, so therefore I'll be fine. <laughs> don't, don't, don't think that. Because you say, oh, you, so it's the abominable, it's the murderers, I'm not a murderer, uh, sexually immoral, I'm not a sexually immoral, uh, sorcerers, I don't do sorcery. Uh, idolaters, I have no idols, and all liars, well, you're lying here. <laughs> okay, so this, this, this encompasses all those that are without Christ. All those without Christ, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What do we see then? 
We see the eternal destiny of those who are saved and we see the eternal destiny of those who are not saved. We'll come to a conclusion. We're directed to walk in the Spirit in the New Testament. To live in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. We are called to abide in God's Word. To draw close to God. Beloved in Christ. In the eternal state, that will be finally and fully realized. We will we'll be ever present in the blazing glory of the Lord our God. The title of my sermon was, Which City Do You Belong To? I end with that question. Which city do you belong to? Do you have the assurance today that you will be in the new Jerusalem? Do you have the assurance today that you will be in the new Jerusalem? Or are you warming your hands in Babylon? Are you warming your hands in the sin of Babylon? In that great and awful city called Babylon? Do you have the assurance today that you will be in the new Jerusalem? The road to the new Jerusalem is a road few are found on. How do we know that? Matthew 7 tells us there are two roads in the world. The narrow road that leads to eternal life and the broad road that leads to destruction. And Jesus says, few are found on the narrow road. Many are found on the broad road that leads to destruction. I ask you today, which road are you on? Are you on the broad road that leads to the great city Babylon, that sinful city? Or are you on the narrow road that leads to the holy city, the new Jerusalem? Are you on a pilgrimage to the lake of fire? Or are you on a pilgrimage to the new Jerusalem? The difference, my dear friends, is that of, of an unbeliever and a believer. The believer has his place in the lake of fire. Sorry, the unbeliever has his place in the lake of fire. And the believer has his place in the ever presence, in the glory of the Lord our God. I pray that you would be one today would say, Pastor, Pray with me today that I too may be found in the eternal state. That I too may be found in the ever presence of God. That I too may be found to be a holy resident of the new Jerusalem. That you would turn from wickedness, come from the broad path onto the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Let us pray.